So welcome to Practical Pediatric Patient Experience. We're going to get started now. Before we get going with the presentation, we have um, just a little bit of housekeeping. The first is to make sure that you guys can hear us. So we want you to raise your hand so we know you can. And this is um, a button in your control panel. <clears throat> it's the red hand button, the control panel. So we've got some hands going up, do we? Are people raising their hands? Yeah, awesome. Okay, good. So um, if you can't hear us or if you have questions at any time during the webinar, also go back into your control panel um, under the questions section. Just click on questions and type in the box and hit send. Um, so questions will only come to us. They won't be seen by everybody. And for people who have questions in the webinar, um, We'll have a short period at the end of the webinar to address questions, answer them live. Um, but we will also answer every question that's submitted and then um, create a Q&A sheet and send that out to all attendees of the webinar. We'll anonymize those things, of course. Um, we also have a couple handouts for you today. They're also in the um, control panel um, under the handout section. It's right above the question section. So the handouts are this, a PDF of this presentation, as well as a bibliography that lists all the research studies that we referenced in putting this together so that um, we don't have to dive too deep into that. And if you guys want to take a look at the research firsthand, you can. And then the last thing is, during our presentation, we're going to be doing some polls. Um, these will just pop up, randomly ask you a question. Um, you can just click on the answer, and then we'll share those answers live. This, these are anonymized, so um, no uh, fears about sharing too much there. Um, just so you know that um, at the end, we'll be giving you a little more detail, but we are sending out continuing education uh, credits certificates after this webinar. Um, so hang tight and you'll be receiving those as well. Okay, I think we're done with the administration. And so what we wanna do is introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm gonna like scoot Rachel in. Sneak over. <laughs> so I'm Christina, CEO of Spellbound, and I work with our team to uh, better understand hospitals and their needs and translate those into things we build in technology. And I'm Rachel Martindale, and I am the director of marketing for Spellbound. I do all of our marketing stuff. Um, I do conferences, events, project management, and a little bit of customer success. So if you ever see Spellbound on social media, that is me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, Christina is going to be the main presenter today. I'm just going to help facilitate with polls and stuff. So you'll kind of see me pop in and out. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Okay, so what I want to start out with is that we are not clinicians. Um, we don't work in hospitals, but we do have the advantage of working with a lot of hospitals across the country um, and working with the clinicians in those hospitals, the staff, and sometimes we even get to um, con have contact with patients. So we see hospitals that are addressing patient experience challenges. We get to hear about their solutions that they've developed, what things have worked well, what things have not worked well, um, and what ideas they have for the future. So this is I think sometimes for us it's really about we're in a position where we can gather a lot of information and that can just be really beneficial to hospitals as kind of like um, a third party that's not necessarily a subject matter expert. So um, so what we do is um, gather stories from hospitals, things that people want to share, um, cool things that we've seen. And in this case, we've coupled it, we've gone out and looked for the research that kind of backs those things. And that's what we're going to be doing today um, is really kind of pulling that all the trends and the patterns that we've seen and maybe all the blog posts you've read about improving patient experience and really kind of tying that in with research studies. And that will, again, be, we don't put the references in this presentation, that's all detailed in the bibliography that you can download. Also, we'll send out the PDF of that after the webinar. So we all know that patient experience matters. Um, for patients, the experience is incredibly important. It's how they perceive every aspect, every interaction of their hospital experience. Um, and it's what they'll blame when things don't go well. And for hospital, pa hospitals, patient experience 
impacts a lot of areas. So whether it's the brand of the hospital, how the hospital is perceived in public, um, public relations, um, certainly HCAP, child HCAP scores, and both of those things directly impact the bottom line. So it's not just about the reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid based on satisfaction scores. When there's a poor patient experience, it's off, there's often poor compliance, and that can really impact efficiency of procedure, cost of care, and throughput, which can directly impact revenue for the hospital. So there, depending on who you talk to in the hospital, there's lots of reasons why they care, care about patient experience. And when patients have a bad experience, they talk about it. They post on social media, they tell friends and family, um, and they don't always necessarily see their responsibility and their outcomes. And this creates a very tricky situation for hospitals in general, and more tricky because um, the people providing care, the staff of the hospital, really are already overloaded with responsibility around outcomes, cost of care, managing risk, all these other things. And so this um, can sometimes be a really daunting task. And so I guess our point is that patient experience is really everyone's responsibility and that everyone can be an advocate and everyone can contribute to it, um, even if it's not maybe directly mandated in different departments. So I think we're going to do our first quick poll. Yeah, absolutely. So we are going to do a quick poll on who is on the call today and be <laughs> helpful for us to know who is watching. That, that way we can cater the presentation a little bit. So I'm going to launch that poll. And if you could just answer that, we will um, show the answers in just a few seconds. Okay, is everyone good voting? All right. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Pull this back up. Oh, I see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Great. So who's on the call today, Rachel? I will share it. Awesome. Nice. So by and large, hi, child life. <laughs> it's great to see you all. I can't see you. It's great to see you all. Awesome. Okay. So let's get back in. Oops. Okay. So we're going to dive right in. Um, seven general practical strategies to improve pediatric patient experience. What we're focusing right now is short-term things. Maybe things could be implemented relatively quickly or with a um, few resources or a short time period. Um, certainly there's lots of ideas and there's lots of areas we could cover and certainly each of these seven topics we could dive really deep into, um, but this is meant as a high-level overview. So for each of the seven strategies, what we're going to cover is we're going to start with a quick hit of research, um, just maybe a research finding or some shared um, outcomes. And then for each, then we're going to look at examples, real world examples, stories we've heard um, out in the field, um, case studies, things like that. And then the last thing we're going to look at is specifically, um, because we are a technology company, what technology is out there to um, assist in creating, um, into, success, into successfully implementing um, that strategy. And all those things work together. Each of these strategies really, I think the, how they all sum up is that overall they're meant to increase cooperation, um, patient cooperation with treatment, and reduce trauma for those patients. So things that we obviously all care about a lot. So the first strategy is no surprise, I'm sure, is around communication and how absolutely critical that is. And you know, when you do any kind of searches or see best practices for um, patient experience, of course, that always floats to the top and there's obviously a reason for it. So the first thing we wanted to share in terms of research um, was something from the New England Journal of medicine, Ooh um, a checklist that they created um, based on a bunch of research that they did. And we thought this was just a really great summary of a lot of things that we probably heard before that seem very no-nonsense and practical and maybe a little bit duh, but it's, um, I think it's worthwhile reviewing. And I really like the methodology that they used for this. So the first thing was that they, they 
combined a lot of techniques. They used interviews where they um, interviewed 250 families about the top three things that um, could they could cause them to judge patient experience as excellent. Um, then they shadowed top performing providers and lower performing providers as um, drawn from the uh, care provider section scores of the Press Ganey um, Medical Practice Survey. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with Prescani, but they're the largest administrator of the CAP survey. And um, they also interviewed top performing care providers to understand their um, best practices, philosophies, tactics. And they also reviewed 1,700 Prescani survey comments from the top 30 and bottom 30 performing providers. So um, just, you know, we can skim through this quickly, but um, I think for a lot of child life specialists, this is um, pretty obvious, but, you know, eye to eye contact, coming to the level of the child, smiling, greeting and using names when known, um, you know, important things around like if there's delays for them, thanking them for waiting as opposed to apologizing um, and then talking about at least one non-medical topic. I think a child life is really great at building rapport. So this is um, obvious, but you know, whether it's school or hobbies or sports. Um, and if, you know, obviously asking questions of the child, um, making notes um, for other team members or for future visits about, um, you know, non something else you can use to talk about in the future. Listening, not interrupting. Um, asking just simple rephrasing of things like asking instead of do you have any questions what questions do you have for me and again thanking the family um, for giving the opportunity to to care for the child um, i think the key takeaways here are that patient experience really seeks to humanize everybody involved in the situation um, the staff at the hospital as well as the patients and their family and that the majority of humanizing really is around communication so we're going to see these themes over over come up over and over again in the webinar and so um, some examples of um, clearly communicating the journey um, to patients and families, um, lots of hospitals are creating their own methods for communication that they will then turn into either training programs um, for staff or publications, white papers, things like that. And so there's lots of them out there. We just pulled a, co a couple of them. Um, the Comfort Talk method from Harvard, the Bathe method from UVA, the Read method from Cleveland Clinic. Um, we've got the references in the bibliography, of course, but um, these are all about giving staff a framework to most efficiently get the information they need from the patient while um, demonstrating empathy. And there's lots of these frameworks. The point we want to make here is that you don't need to roll out an entire framework or training program to improve communication. Simply taking a few questions or looking at the similarities between these methods and taking a few questions, even one question to kind of, or one tactic to incorporate, um, you know, is something you could decide within your team or your department um, to make small changes over time. Um, and this, since they're all proven to work and all are research-based, then there's, uh, you know, little risk and really what it is also saying is there's no one real like singular definitive best practice that there's lots of ways you can develop programs around this so i think we have another quick poll yeah so we are going to um, launch a poll in just a second about um, if your team or your hospital has any communications programs for your staff and you should be seeing that right now if you could answer we'll continue in just a few seconds Okay, we're all, I think we're all set. I think so. We're gonna try to share it. I share. There we go. Yeah. So I think um, this is really interesting too, and something that we have seen in the past that sometimes hospitals have these programs and they're not necessarily rolled out to all staff, um, and maybe they're not necessarily advertised well or um, not maybe included as typical or maybe included only as onboarding and then not reviewed or revisited over time. So I think we see this a lot. Okay, thanks Rachel. So we're gonna move on to the um, second one, which is about incorporating medical play and simulations. Um, I think, oh, I think I missed a slide here, sorry. 
the technology one for um, clear about communication. So this slide, um, I just want to emphasize that there is no quick technology fix to communicate with patients. This is not, um, I think, something anybody should be targeting, and uh, certainly not in pediatrics. I don't believe that in terms of communicating, technology should come between um, the human being in the hospital and the human being being treated. So um, there are tools out there, and some of these have difficulty in implementation, whether they're connecting to you know, um, health records or other types of things. So there are communication tools that you might want to use that hospitals might want to implement to use with patients. But when we're talking about quick strategies, strategies to implement, um, I think the one thing we will focus on is that we've seen a large array of patient education tools that utilize technology. And since patient education is a really key part of communication, um, that we thought we would just mention these. And I'm sure these are very familiar, but um, certainly prep books and all the different ways and all that we've seen that people make prep books um, or the um, materials that go into prep books, um, including video, even when it's homemade shot video off of like the department iPad. Um, there's 360 video, which is um, a, the type of video um, where if you, the viewer of the video can actually control the angle of the camera and look, be able to see the situation from all angles, not just the angle that say the director, the creator of the video intended. Um, there's augmented reality, which is the adding of digital experiences on top of the real world. So sometimes with headsets, but often viewed through the screen of a mobile device where you might be, looks like a camera view, you might be looking at the wall and suddenly that wall disappears and it's the ocean. Um, certainly incorporating even simple things like photographs and audio recordings that could be done on mobile devices into those prep books. And we've seen a lot of great mobile apps that have been created by hospitals, specifically targeting um, communication and patient education. Um, one of our favorites is Simply Saying by Phoenix Children's Hospital, which it's free, available out there. Families can download it. Um, but we know that lots of hospitals have put time and effort into it um, to create those things. So if you don't already have one for your hospital, taking a look at those um, might be an interesting resource. Okay, now we're going to get to medical plan simulations. Just get excited about that. Um, so I think what's important here is that um, Obviously, this is research-backed. Oh, you know, this is no surprise to anybody on the call here, but the overall finding is that play interventions work. And there's lots of research, particularly coming out of the UK, around this and more and more clinical research coming out um, and actually connecting it to um, the negative perception of hospitalization for kids. And, you know, we always like to look at the child's perspective as well. Um, and this one came from um, BMC Pediatrics is, you know, the child really thinking of, and, you know, in the UK, they call them play specialists and really um, appreciating that role in the hospital, um, reducing fear and anxiety, able to get um, through and actually describing things as fun, which would never have been anticipated, uh, certainly but not by the parents of the situation. So um, there's lots of child life specialists here today, experts in medical play. So, um, you know, we're not going to really focus on that one too much. Um, but the important thing to note is that there is an increasing amount of clinical research that is backing what child life has known all along. So we're going to take a quick look at a few examples and we're going to focus in on a specific, um, just to help for time-wise, um, in this case an MRI, a scan. Um, when a child needs a, um, to have an MRI, as we know, obviously it doesn't hurt, but this can be a really um, overwhelming or anxiety producing or fearful experience for kids. So every hospital has its own way of, of introducing um, simulations or medical play in this case. Um, and we've seen in a lot of cases, child life really spearheading new ways of engaging imaging patients. Um, so child life teams partnering with radiology and anesthesiology and creating programs um, to say reduce the need for sedation for these simple scans and how these partnerships can really have a massive impact on pediatric imaging. Um, you know, we've seen cool MRI rooms when, you know, with the the wrappers on the MRI machine and the decorations in the room to really make it feel like a different place. Or um, we've seen really cool, um, you know, medical toys and a child size um, uh, 
toys that can make them feel like they're the doctor in the situation and that um, it can help them familiarize themselves. And um, we've seen a lot increasing use of technology, which we're going to go into a little deeper in the next slide, but, you know, virtual reality or augmented reality in terms of creating simulations. Um, I think before I get any deeper into the technology, do we want to do a quick poll here? Yeah. Um, so we were going to ask how frequently um, does you or your team use simulations or replicas to prepare children for procedures? Okay, we got some responses. Sure, we do. They're still rolling in real quick. So we'll okay. Awesome. I'm going to close it. And share. And share our responses. Awesome. Really cool. Yeah, I think I think when we see higher use of these things, it's really indicative of just like, you know, people knowing that it works and seeing that it works. Okay, let's put this back here. Um, so I'm going to dive deeper into two of the pieces of technology specifically, virtual reality simulation and augmented reality simulation. So we're going to start on the left, um, virtual reality headset on a child. And what we're trying to show in the background is what they're actually seeing. Um, and so virtual reality uses headsets to completely immerse um, the user in the experience, which means they are not in contact with the real world. They can't see what's going on around them or hear that. So what they do, they should feel like they're there in this virtual reality experience. Um, so you can see an MRI machine and um, maybe some of the staff in, in the situation there. On the right is augmented reality. And in this case, the augmented reality is using a mobile device to deliver um, a simulation um, and actually a play simulation of an um, MRI machine. And so what it does is it is um, pointing, actually it's hard to tell in the photo, but pointing at a card that is placed on the desk. And when the camera of the phone recognizes that card, it puts a little mini 3D MRI on top. And then the card can be spun, that can be examined from all areas. And so in both cases, these simulations represent a relatively accurate portrayal of what the patient will see. It's enough to give them a sense of what it'll look like. Neither of these simulations is 100% like accurate. So both are feel a slightly cartoony, even the virtual reality, although the virtual reality will is likely a little more real, has a little more realism to it. Um, and this is because those type of 3D experiences can really be, um, require a lot of memory to run on devices. And so when you're introducing additional hardware, it's possible with virtual reality. And um, as opposed to like, if you're using somebody's mobile device, you don't want it to be slow and jerky and, and not run smoothly the simulation. Um, both um, in, can be interactive, although virtual reality has a lot of limitations. And so when you look at a simulation, like on the right, um, in this case, the child can press the buttons. And in, in this particular simulation, they're giving um, a PET, uh, an MRI scan. Both simulations, they can accurately hear what is it going to sound like um, and all the variety of sounds that come from an MRI. So um, thinking about what might be best for patients or at what point in the patient um, workflow might make sense. You know, certainly families don't necessarily have VR headsets laying around, but a lot of hospitals are buying them and incorporating that into the, you know, how they prep patients for the scans. Um, and certainly with virtual uh, augmented reality with a mobile device, anybody can use that. And hospitals are starting to figure out that they can distribute those things to families to prepare before they come in um, for the procedure. So preparation at home. Okay, distraction therapy. Again, no surprise here that um, this works. I think what's really important here is that um, the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management in 2017 came out with a clinical study that said that distraction therapy is effective for managing procedural pain. 
it's not something that was necessarily surprising, but um, unfortunately, in the past, a lot of research has not clearly stated this. Um, and this is primarily because there simply haven't been a lot of uh, control trial research in distraction therapy as pain management. There's been a lot of quality improvement or other types of um, introductory studies. So a lot of foundation laying was happen, happening, but now we're starting to see these studies um, emerge, which is really great to just, um, you know, reinforce what I think most people on this webinar already know, um, that the efficacy is there. And so child life spe specialists are obviously experts in distraction therapy, and we've heard some great stories of how um, child life teams have helped care team members improve their skills when a CLS can't be there. Um, so sometimes uh, we've heard stories about care teams leveraging um, child life specialists as advisors, um, and particularly starting with common procedures that can make a big impact. So maybe these are procedures that are difficult to perform without tears and that are frequently performed um, across many patients. Um, so like dressing changes, um, needle-related medical procedures, and certainly encouraging thing movement, particularly around like post-surgical um, walking. So, um, you know, some of the stories that, examples that we've heard um, using, you know, we, uh, we heard a story about a three-year-old burn victim who had a skin graft and had to have, you know, not only be encouraged to move, but have her dressings changed. And obviously incredibly painful and, and she didn't want to cooperate and how the child life specialists were um, brought in to effectively help her um, and how much that the nurses learned from those child life specialists around helping her so much so that not only were they managing the pain of the burn dressing change um, and of the movement that they were encouraging, but they were able to um, start an IV while they were under, that child was undergoing that. So just the power of distraction therapy um, in those situations. And then when we think about um, distraction therapy, it's obviously not just for little kids, it's for everybody. But, um, you know, we had a great story about a 16-year-old with a needle phobia because of a chronic condition. She'd had a lot of traumatic needle sticks. And, um, and it, it, the ability to use distraction therapy effectively with teenagers um, during these short procedures um, and certainly gamifying other aspects of the hospital. We know child life specialists are awesome about creating scavenger hunts and other tools um, to really encourage patients getting up and walking. Um, and so I think all of these really are about how the child life team can impact lots of different areas of, of care, but how they can share that um, with colleagues. Um, and I think I used the example of, of the nurse before, but I watched um, a nurse um, show a butterfly needle to a child, and I'm sure this isn't completely unique, uh, although I haven't seen it often, but really showing the, the wings of the butterfly needle and, and likening it to a butterfly and explaining that the needle part was like a tongue that would just sip up a little blood so they could run the tests, um, and really creating this narrative um, that you know, the child life specialist had helped her create um, around that. And then while it was doing it, all while prepping the patient's arm. Um, and in what then for the distraction part was able to give her, um, in this case, it is an augmented reality card where um, a butterfly was present, where the child was able to activate, activate this 3D butterfly to kind of provide continuity to the story and be distracted. And that was the point where she did the needle stick. So I think one thing we need to call out though is in using technology for, especially for short procedures like this, there's a real caveat around not um, choosing technology that really adds time to the procedure. Obviously efficiency, is important. Um, and so, you know, looking for techniques that really work um, given the length of that procedure. Um, and looking at this, in this case, it was a mobile device. It was readily at hand. It was quick to launch. So um, not all technology is going to work in this situation is what we're saying. Okay. So number four, work closely as a care team. I've heard this lots of times. Um, one thing that some things that we found that we thought were really interesting um, is that aside from positive health outcomes, um, the single most important consideration for families is teamwork of that care team. And um, this came from Prescani researchers. Um, so using data from Prescani's inpatient pediatric patient experience database, um, the researchers identified performance paths for achieving optimal patient experience. Um, and of note, the single most important one was the perception that families have of that their care team is working together. Um, 
so you know the top scores for the statement staff work together to care for my child item um, so what this tells us is that parents um, feel as if when parents feel that the care team is working well together sharing information on the same page that they all know what's going on that it is more likely that those families are going to recommend the hospital to families and friends and so that score element of the the cap survey increases i think we have a quick poll yeah so we are going to be asking you all um how frequently does your team or your hospital talk about your patient experience goals and ways to improve PX. So as a way of just showing teamwork and um, how you guys just approach that goal. Yeah. We're gonna talk a little bit about this right after here about the importance of it, but mm -hmm. let's get a sense of where folks are. Okay, about 50% is answered, so I'm gonna close it. Awesome. And then we'll share. Cool. Okay, so about once a month is probably the most, um, but it's nice to see daily um, creeping up there. It's great. So I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, so some ex great examples we've seen, and this is going to kind of solidify some of my previous comments. Um, the first is um, an example. Um, the quote on the left says, talk daily with the team about patient experience. Don't wait until your next meeting or your quarterly review of satisfaction scores. And this came from um, a physician um, from McLean Children's Medical who's in uh, charge of the director of the emergency department. And um, they did the this, there's a couple of small things that they did, but this was one of them, like really start encouraging um, different team members uh, talking about patient experience on a regular, on a daily basis. And um, they were able to improve their patient satisfaction scores by 15% in one quarter. So just really evidence that this, like small changes can really make big impact. Um, and on the right, we had a, we have this great example of um, a child life team at a hospital in Texas that trained their hands, hospital transport team on basic distraction techniques and supplied some simple, easy to integrate tools for them to have on hand. So whether it was an emergency situation or just moving patients to procedure rooms, um, the transport team was in a better situation to bring in a calmer, um, less anxiety, um, less anxious patient into those situations. Um, and so I do want to just say, like, I've said this a couple of times and stories we hear, I know this can be difficult when um, child life is struggling with resources or adding team members. And, but in this case, I just wanted to share this because particularly this really raised the level of respect um, for that child life team and improved patient experience for the times when the child life team couldn't um, be present. And really that garnered a lot of recognition for their efforts. And of course, overall, it improved patient experience um, in the hospital. So a great example of a team working closely together um, to share knowledge and um, improve patient experience. So technology examples. Um, one thing we really wanted to touch on was um, over and over again, uh, we read about and hear about and see that um, ch children when they're staying in the hospital may have many different care providers, um, many different hospital staff are visiting, um, and so that, that that can feel chaotic, and that if we making that handoff um, feel more natural or feel have some element of consistency to it, that it can really work to um, improve patient experience. So this is um, this again is a story that we had heard. It was spearheaded by a child life team at a hospital on the East Coast. Um, and so they distributed some augmented reality cards to the care team um, for um, a patient. And so that each person had this mini um, virtual uh, like animal that they could hold in their hand, a card that would trigger a 3D animal. Um, and so it was kind of like an avatar, right? So when a member of the team entered the room, the child got used to saying, who are you? And really, the child was asking about which animal are you, but it gave the team member an, an opportunity to say, oh, I'm, 
your uh, your anesthesiologist, Dr. So-and-so, or whatever, uh, and to introduce themselves and then pull out the, the card and say, I'm the lion. And um, so team members could have different little avatars that um, the child could, even though they might be different people there for different reasons, that there was one consistent element. So um, that was a great story. We saw the team again coming together. Number five, create a welcoming space. Um, there's increasingly, there's empirical evidence supporting that the built environment, so the physical environment, um, may affect not only the physical, but the psychosocial uh, well-being of patients and their families and hospital staff. And uh, so based on a recent article in Health Environments Research and Design, um, they looked at the body of research as a whole around physical space and the benefits associated that with that seem to stem from six main areas, which we've listed here. So windows and nature views, uh, theme, nature themed art, cleanliness, spaciousness, sense of control and privacy. Um, so based, you know, I think there's a lot of supporting evidence there. We've got this listed in the bibliography. Um, when you look at that in practice, a lot of hospitals already do this. Um, these pictures we're showing you here are from Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. I don't know if anyone is on the webinar um, from LPCH, but um, hi everyone. We included this because we were um, involved in a very small way as, as part of the rebuild, but um, it's, a great example of really utilizing all six of those aspects in terms of creating a welcoming space. Um, however, this was a massive build that was 12 years in the making. Um, you know, they have gorgeous artwork and nature themes inside and out, all windows look over the garden. And there's like a lot of great places and a lot of, most hospitals we visit have these six aspects and they're awesome. So, um, but most people are not positioned to do a massive redesign project. So in lieu of any massive redesign projects, um, we've seen some neat little tricks in the meantime. So um, when we think about control, um, teaching patients or families how to control even just one aspect of their environment, and I'll use lighting as an example. So simple things like how to operate the blinds or the curtains in their room, sometimes this isn't obvious, um, if there's dimmer switches, or even pointing out where all the light switches are and what they do, because a lot of times there's different switches on the wall. Um, so helping orient them to the space and showing them areas where they do have control is really important. Um, we've seen a lot of, particularly child life teams, introduce nature themes when possible, whether it's in their prep books or wall decals or coloring pages, small things that don't necessarily change the permanent like design or structure of the hospital, but that make a difference. Um, and then the last piece is allowing patients to personalize their space. And I know this can be tricky. Um, sometimes it can't be personalized, but even mentioning it to patients and families helps uh, letting them know what they can and cannot do. And we saw some great examples at some hospitals here in the Midwest of, um, you know, providing an empty picture frame that was permanently attached to the wall where patients could slip their artwork in and out of the picture frame or picture of family, but also having those kind of elements in shared or community spaces, like in the family room um, or community rooms where the children could share their artwork with other people around them. So that kind of familiarity and contribution um, can really help to the environment. Um, so looking at some of the technology, there's more and more technology emerging in this space of being able to create a welcoming um, space for children. And um, so the first thing uh, on the left here um, is an example of a light wall. Um, there's also projections where they physically, you know, use a projector to um, put animations or um, images or movements um, on top of things. Think about like suddenly projecting birds flying over a wall in the hospital. Um, so those are pieces of technology that we're seeing in more and more hospitals, particularly as they're redesigning. Um, but um, on the right is augmented reality. Again, we'll be mentioning this quite a bit, but augmented reality is a way of using the devices people already have on them, um, holding that device to 
up to the real world so that the screen can place a 3D experience. And so here it's hard to see in the picture, but what it's doing is pointing at a, a piece of artwork um, or it can point at a mural or a hospital sign, everything, something that's existing already in the hospital environment um, and the camera recognizing it and placing an interactive 3D experience on top of that. So it can bring artwork to you know digital life um, and it can certainly enc encourage um, participation. Um, so I think that you know a whole light wall might seem overwhelming, but even using um, looking at tools like projectors and things like that, how to trans digitally transform space, and certainly augmented reality, both these things um, can create imaginative play spaces. They both can encourage movement, um, so getting patients and families up and walking, going to, to destinations within the hospital itself, so they can become aware of more services, um, and certainly reduce the scariness of the hospital environment. Now we do have other videos, particularly of like augmented reality, obviously. Um, but if, if people are look interested in seeing those videos, we can send them along in follow-up emails. So um, sixth point is to include family members and caregivers. Um, there is a ton of research around patient and family-centered care. Um, and it's been around for a while, which is why there's a ton of, of research on it. Um, it's been particularly emphasized in the last 15 years. And what we found is that hospitals all over the country have really developed their own culture around patient and family-centered care. Um, and it's important to emphasize that it's stuck around because it works. And when we think about patient and family-centered care, it's obviously, you know, beneficial to the patient and family, but a lot of the research is also pointing out that staff satisfaction ratings significantly increase when there's um, heavy culture around patient and family centered care at the hospital. So added benefit um, for the hospital. I mean, the point that parents and caregivers know their children best is a given. Um, and in, but sometimes it's difficult to figure out how to incorporate them into the care. So some great examples that we've seen um, are really about giving parents simple tasks so that they feel like they are contributing to the situation. A parent, uh, as a parent, I know when you are um, fearful for your child or anxious or nervous, um, you can feel in the way or unsure how to contribute in a make meaningful or productive way, and that can just contribute to more feelings of being lost and helpless. So um, g getting rid of those negative feelings, giving them small tasks to do, or even it's about, I need you to stand here exactly like this. <laughs> um, uh, I think that there are more opportunities to even just hear from parents about challenges of caregiving, um, to initiate those conversations before um, discharge time, um, and not everybody can do this, but if you can, or in the situation, describe what daily care caregiving activities could be like for them. And uh, some of the most compelling stories that we've heard came from child life specialists who were able to um, really become part of that family support network for, um, for parents um, and caregivers and saying, well, here are some of our techniques and our tools. I sh I, here's where you can purchase these tools. This is how, you know, it's particularly around distraction therapy, or in some cases, is gifting when you can um, tools to um, to families, pointing out online resources, whatever, um, to help them, especially kids with chronic conditions where you know that distraction therapy is going to be increasingly important. Just helping, giving parents coping mechanisms is um, is a great example that we've seen. Um, a specific example of technology, um, and this again to me is a picture that really kind of epitomized a, a care team really working well, or like a, a team working well together. Um, and it is a, a parent um, doing comfort, providing comfort positioning for the child, um, so the the child's um, arms are under control. The parent is also holding um, a mobile device, and in the foreground is the child life specialist, and in the background is the nurse um, prepping the patient for the procedure. Um, all of these. Um, people working together, um, everyone fulfilling, fulfilling a role. Um, these are like the great kind of um, stories that we, we see about um, when teams really come together. So the last one strategy we're going to look at is about encouraging patients. And, um, and this can be taken in a lot of different ways, have a lot of different meaning. Um, now, we did pull this one little bit of research from the Annals of Family Medicine about five key strategies. Now, what this is really about is 
increasing patient compliance with treatment, or as it referred to it as activating patients. Um, and for a, it was originally written about adults, but um, this uh, really applies to kids as well. Um, Top performing providers use at least some of these techniques, and we see this as a way um, really that child life already contributes in major ways because they do many of these things are, are relevant. So emphasizing ownership or providing a, some semblance of control for the patient, um, partnering with patients and family, identifying small steps um, when you can, frequent follow-ups or check-ins with patients, and um, showing care and concern, obviously, things that uh, child life does already. In terms of some examples that we've seen, um, there's, there's lots of obvious ones, milestone markers, uh, the Beads of Hope program, you know, stickers, stuffed animals, lots of hospitals provide different programs of kind of giving children physical mementos of the milestones that they've achieved so that they can have a positive outlook on that. Um, just like with parents, giving children jobs to do, whether it's holding something or, or doing something in a specific way. Um, one thing we were interested in learning about um, was motivational interviewing. And now I had read about this in context of usually, I've seen a bunch of research usually in context of adults, but we heard a story from a physical therapist who uses it to successfully with oncology patients to um, get them to set small goals for themselves um, and then have those patients meet those goals. So asking the child what one small thing they want to be able to accomplish within the context of treatment was a great way to, to build trust and give them a semblance of control. Um, and then come full circle back to communication, really basic statements that we hear about encouragement um, or again, that whole what questions are in your head that you wanna talk about, that we can talk about right now is opening channels for communication. So encouragement sometimes is just about communication. Um, and the last story, um, technology story we're going to leave with, um, child life knows all about meeting children at the development level. So whatever technology you're using, um, there's guides out there about video games and mobile games and, um, less so with augmented and virtual reality, but we're starting to see that come through about age appropriateness and helping, um, child life decide when to use certain tools with patients, um, but certainly starting with development lens, developmental level. Um, this particular story we had, again, this is a picture of a team working together. The seven-year-old had a brain aneurysm and was not participating in his recovery post-surgery. Not And so in this picture, we have an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, a rehab engineer. There's a child life specialist involved as well. So, uh, you know, the they were working together to help this child meet their, their milestones, his milestones, um, and using technology as a motivator, understanding that, that was a thing that motivated him, and then working together to figure out how to integrate that technology into that child's care at that time. So again, back to empathy and developing empathy um, as a major strategy for um, improving patient experience. So that was a quick high level overview. You want to dive deeper. We've got the bibliography for you in terms of the research. Um, seven strategies to practical strategies to improve patient experience. Um, so I think one thing we want to emphasize now is that that's all well and good. But if it's important that you understand the baseline journey for your patients um, um, and then to know what pieces that you should be working to improve. And with all that um, many hospital staff have to do, it's difficult to take a step back and see how all the pieces come together and not just the piece that you work on um, and because there's not enough time in the day. So um, what we found is that um, we've been helpful as an outsider um, to hospitals to kind of just create um, a visualization of this patient journey for them. Um, and so we call it a journey map and it can help be used to help identify gaps in patient experience or specific points of contact that can be improved for patients. And we work with hospitals to do this. Um, so we, you know, they give us information and we create this tool for them. Um, it's a tool that's easily shareable with um, other members of the care team, um, that with your the rest of your team, and um, we've seen people use it um, to better understand patient experience. So we're going to show Rachel's going to show you two examples of uh, patient uh, journey maps that we've created. Yeah. 
Awesome. So this is the first example, and it is an MRI journey map. And what we did was um, we looked at the patient journey between pre-visit, check-in, pre-scan, scan, and post-scan, as well as um, documenting based on the team input what the patient and the family were experiencing during those times and um, who also they came into contact with. So we were able to find that they could um, just be able to see every part of the journey and from there find gaps as well as um, figure out different ways that they could implement um, uh, just intervention so that they would experience less sedation rates essentially for MRIs. Our next journey map is the physical therapy journey map, and it just shows the, the journey for the patient as well as the therapist and where they interact. And um, this was used as a starter for conversations around the tools and um, the goals that they wanted to accomplish um, based on each pathway and um, what could be done at home versus at the clinic. So just for our webinar attendees, we're actually offering a complimentary patient journey maps uh, session. And um, this will just be about 30 minutes and you can schedule a call with me. Um, the link is actually gonna be in the chat box to your right. I believe it should be showing up, uh, but we'll also be sending it in um, the follow-up email. But yeah, if you want to um, be able to find um, a journey map for a particular department or a particular procedure to identify any gaps in services or any areas of improvement, um, as well as potentially to secure or justify funding for something, we're happy to do it for you and happy to just have an interview and talk about those things and then send over a journey map back to you. Um, also, we wanted to um, emphasize that this is private information. We know that and we will not share it. Um, we um, use it just to make the map and send it right back to you. Um, and yeah, so be able to, you'll be able to schedule that either um, right now in the link or after the call. And we will enter into a time of Q&A now. So we will pull up some of the questions that have been asked over the webinar. And feel free to ask any questions now if you have any that have come to mind. Um, and I will take a look at what we have. OK. Um, so the first question is, do you have any tips for using the distract distraction cards when it feels as though I don't have enough hands? I found it hard to hold the iPad and the cards for patients and the procedures I support require the patient to hold still so they really can't so they really can't help in those situations. Yeah. Um, so what we've heard from various child life teams, um, some are really crafty and have constructed or purchased um, stands um, for the devices. Um, we, we saw um, a team um, actually here in Michigan that had turned an old IV pole into some like crazy um, iPad stand if you're not um, super handy like that. Um, taking a look and seeing is there other ways that we could provide support in holding the device for the child. Um, there's some pretty flexible stands out there. Um, if there's a parent um, present and if it's possible um, that they're present and that they can be close enough to help, then of course that's a task that they can be given to do. Um, that's not obviously always possible and in those cases I think a lot of times we say if it's you know not working out in terms of that type of positioning um, we'd love to hear feedback uh, about that because we're continuing to develop the technology in a way that can encompass it but it's really it doesn't have to be suitable for all the situations so um, if any of those other tips that we've heard from other child life specialists don't work um, then we um, I was, was going to say there's another stand that where we had um, a clip that was attached to like the, the iPad that held the card at a certain distance from the camera. So um, we can follow up with you afterward um, and certainly you can contact us anytime and give us the specific situation because we take that input and we make improvements to the distraction cards in that case. I also wanted to mention that we do like some of our um, myth series cards, we are implementing the detach oh, mode. Right. Yeah, so we um, we actually heard that have heard that feedback multiple times and we are um, I'm currently implementing a detached mode where um, once the experience comes onto the screen, you don't actually need the card anymore and it stays, um, the interaction stays on the screen. So you don't have to hold both things um, and that's going to be released fairly soon within the next, I think, few months. I think um, um, our developer has already like worked on it uh, for our myth series. Um, let's see. Next question would be, 
Um, what's the best way to start implementing some of these technologies into the hospital? Um, I think what we, success stories we've heard from, um, specifically from child life teams, we've heard this a little bit from OTPT and uh, we're starting to work more with other departments in the hospital as well, but is really coming up with a really specific use case um, and starting there. So when we taught some of the hospitals, we talked to just, you know, I think we used some examples, only used it for needle-related medical procedures um, and or picked a technology to, to implement for that um, or to implement as, say, part of the their MRI, try it without sedation programs. Hospitals, have, you know, they call it all different things, but all of them usually, most hospitals that do MRIs have a program to reduce sedation. So picking a really specific tool that works in that situation, that would work toward their goals, proving it there, and then um, kind of getting that buy-in to rule it out more broadly across. So particularly with distraction therapy and other technology tools that fit, that in, with, can fit within specific use cases and then be rolled out more broadly. Um, we've seen success with teams um, come in and kind of demonstrate, a, you know, on a really narrow scale value um, to other departments. And then we've worked with those teams and those other departments to kind of spread the cost across different budget lines or, um, you know, figure out alternate ways of getting, helping teams get tools. So I think um, having a really specific use case, having really specific goals around that, and then being able to share successes more broadly across the hospital is what we've heard as the best tips from child life teams. Awesome. I might have a better answer later when we can think about it and, and send the, the responses out later too. <laughs> Um, let's see. Do we have time for one more? I, I think we are running out of time, so okay. we should probably just email the rest right. of the questions out. So, um, yeah, we thank you so much for your time. Um, thanks so much for attending this webinar. We will, um, yeah, like I said, email all the rest of the questions and the answers out to you in the follow-up email, as well as the link to sign up for the um, journey map if you would like as um, a free session um, and also the bibliography and the slides to this presentation. Awesome. Um, and Christina is also going to mention that we're going to be at conferences coming up. So, yeah. so this is some of our team here. Um, the human ones you might see at um, ACLP or we're going to be at the Barrel Patient Experience Conference in the next few weeks. So if you see any of these humans here, um, say hi to us. And uh, um, and you might not see Joya, our office dog. She's, she's busy working. We leave her back home <laughs> to do all the work for us. So uh, thanks again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you in the future.